Hello, everyone, and welcome to CSA's webinar series, CSA Cloud Bytes. Today's webinar is titled, Why Cloud Needs Network Detection and Response. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter your questions at any time during the presentation using the question tab that's at the bottom of your screen. We've reserved time towards the end of your webcast to address the questions. Additionally, the slides from this webinar are not provided. However, feel free to check out the attachments and links section if there are additional resources. You can also access this recording anytime. You just need to use the same link to view the webinar again or to share it with a colleague. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by three distinguished speakers. First, I have Dr. Anton, who is the head of solution strategy over at Google Cloud Security. He's involved in security solution strategy at Google Cloud, where he arrived via Chronicle Security acquisition back in July 2019. Prior to Google Cloud, he was a research VP and distinguished analyst at Gardner for Technical Professionals, where he covered a broad range of security um, operations and detection and response topics and was credited with inventing the term EDR. I also have with me Vijit, who is the Senior Director of Product Management at CoreLite, um, where he uh, products for the cloud portfolio at CoreLite, excuse me. Previously as Director of Product Cloud Segmentation at Juniper Networks, he managed their portfolio spanning data center switching, cloud network and security, and prior to that was an engineer where he built and shipped some of the fastest routers in the world and holds several patents in networking. And finally, I have with me Edward, who is a senior product marketing manager at Coralite and has eight years of experience working in cybersecurity industry, uh, representing uh, IAS, DevSecOps, and vulnerability management solutions, including his most recent role as director of marketing at Cloud Passage and senior product marketing manager at Tripwire. So we're really excited to have everyone joining us today. Thank you so much for taking a little bit of time with us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our presenters. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining this morning. Uh, hi to Anton and Ed as well. Thanks for joining me on this webinar. Uh, quick note on the agenda. We are going to start with, uh, you know, Anton's going to start with sort of covering at a high level from his perspective on why network monitoring and network telemetry is important and what are some of the common <coughs> people get into. And then we'll specifically deep dive into, you know, in the world, uh, in the world of cloud uh, security, uh, what role does network monitoring play? Uh, and then we can get into some specific use cases uh, in cloud IAS environments where network monitoring uh, is valuable. And then we can sort of draw a picture of what a ideal network monitoring stack looks like and then get into a few slides of uh, reference architecture. So with that, uh, let me hand it off to Anton. Anton. Perfect, perfect. Uh, looking forward to speaking with you guys and of course with everybody. I want to depart very quickly and very briefly from the cloud and kind of talk about some of the advantages of network monitoring today. Because, of course, we know that going back 10 years, 20 years, uh, we all know of NSM, collecting pickups, uh, network metadata flows. I mean, the technology and the approach to doing uh, this for security goes away many, many years and decades, in fact. But why it matters today, uh, I wanted to kind of shed some light on why it matters and maybe cover some of the misconceptions that I've encountered. And then we're going to jump straight to the cloud. So of course, these are painfully obvious, but you have to justify this to your boss or your boss's boss. These are very useful. You can monitor and manage devices that you cannot instrument with agents if you want to do endpoint, but you absolutely cannot deploy agents on some of these devices. Some of these have no OS to speak of or no full featured OS. There are many other reasons. Sometimes it's operationally infeasible. Like you cannot push agents sometimes to personal PCs that are used for work. There are many, many more scenarios where you would want to do security monitoring, but you cannot get logs and you cannot get uh, endpoint telemetry like with EDR. So network is the answer. Frankly, is it the best answer? Hey, hey, it's the only answer. Of course, you don't have agents, which I, I feel like people have been a little bit less scared about agents nowadays, but I still see organizations who are agent resistant or maybe like agent afraid. In this case, yeah, admittedly, there are genuine challenges with agents sometimes. Uh, however much I may love EDR, I know that agents are sometimes poorly coded. They can be attacked. Uh, they are occasionally corrupted by the attacker. So that part is kind of obvious, but still useful to remind people. Now, here's the number three. What about the broad visibility coverage? What does it mean, actually? Well, this was the original argument, at least in my mind, for, for, for doing NSM or what Gartner called NDR, after briefly, after briefly calling an NTA, um, 
it's a way to cover a lot of systems, a lot of IT, a lot of network with one or few devices. Again, if you're deploying 50,000 agents, you may have to deploy um, five, 10, or, or fewer number of network monitoring appliances or technologies or, or whatever other components. So you have a lot more coverage, a lot more visibility coverage with fewer security components. Now, we can debate, and some people have debated this with me, that it's an authoritative record, but to me, reliably captured network data decoded to layer seven uh, is kind of an authoritative record of communication. Uh, sure, you can co communicate via carrier pigeon or by whatever offline method, but to me, these are more esoteric. If you are communicating on the network, there would be a record of it somewhere. Now, monitoring is out of band. This to me is less of an advantage nowadays because people have been looking at many other approaches, but to me, the fact that you can monitor without disrupting anything, not slowing down anything, well, yeah, you can slow down a switch sometimes if you configure it badly to capture traffic, separate story. And of course, sometimes you see things that the endpoint does not have. It's the context that endpoint lacks would be somewhat useful. To me, these are true in 2021. Uh, some of them, frankly, were true in 1991. And yeah, there is that. But at the same time, they're absolutely true today. And to me, this is why we are talking about this. That's why the NDR and NSM and all this is very much alive and is used by people all over the world, probably growing too. Sometimes people say, yeah, yeah, Anton, you can give the same webcast uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and uh, you would kind of be uh, spouting the same propaganda. So there are some negatives and they, people bring up these things. And you know what? These are common misconceptions we all encountered. Again, people dealing with network security monitoring have all seen them. Of course, if you look at my uh, old Gartner blog, you'd see me um, discuss the risks of risks of encryption to network monitoring. Risks not to users, but to network monitoring. Of course, if we, are, if we live in the world of complete TLS, SSL, some challenges arise. People do say that, but it's not really true, right? You can monitor encrypted data. You can, well, decrypt it. You can make conclusions from encrypted data. You can focus on metadata. You can focus on flows. I mean, there are ways around it. Are they all as good as having clear text? No. But are they useful? To me, they're very useful. I mean, look at the cottage industry that uh, was uh, that appeared around monitoring certificates, uh, around monitoring things around types of certificates where they issued. You can detect threats by, by doing some of the stuff. So this to me is very useful. Now, I, I, I remain good friends with Richard Stienan, who in 2003 announced that IDS is dead, network IDS specifically. And you know what? It's not really dead. <laughs> network detection is not dead. And uh, we, have now, we now have NDR, we now have whatever next generation IDS, however it's defined. And to me, this is this remains very useful and this remains a central control for many organizations. So there are more choices. There are people, if people had EDR 15 years ago, maybe the direction of the technology would, go diff would be different. However, I'm not so sure because OS back in the day was not as stable. Now, what about the point that network monitoring today is an auxiliary control? You need endpoint first. Frankly, I've seen enough environments where it's the truth. It's not a misconception. The point is that you need endpoint first, but then you need network monitoring for the reasons I just presented. It may not be a misconception, but it doesn't invalidate the need for the NDR and traffic analysis. Now, people who naively, naively look at only egress, ingress or north-south traffic are just deluding themselves. I mean, when I did this research back in manualist days, I've noticed some vendors who basically focus on the gate, the traffic departing, traffic coming in. And I was like, wait a second, you're selling it really short. You're not looking at all the chances for lateral, all the people staging data before they steal it, all the possible internal compromises. Now, you really do need to look at east-west and north-south. To me, if you're just doing one, you may be cutting down the value of the approach on, on your own. You're doing it yourself. Now, here's the tricky one. The old, old hands in this area would sometimes say, hey, pick up or it didn't happen. And what they mean by this is that if you do flows, if you do metadata, you're sort of not doing the right thing. To me, many years ago, probably that would have merit. 
But today, the types of decoding that Zeek, well, Corelite uh, open source technology does, and of course, Corelite commercial, uh, decoding is so reliable and so effective, then to me, I would say layer seven metadata already didn't happen. I don't think it's pick up or it didn't happen. If you don't have you know, woeful bad bugs in your capture and you don't have woeful bad bugs in your decoders, Layer 7 metadata is probably what you'd need because of the next point, network traffic is too expensive to capture. And you know what? Complete PCAP on a 10 gig link that you want to keep for a year, it really is expensive. So it's not a myth. The point is that you really don't need that in most cases. Like here's a funny one. Uh, many years ago, in 2013 or so, I wrote a Gartner paper focused on what we called then network forensics, which in our mind was uh, using traffic captures, full packet captures, for investigative and sometimes uh, detection purposes as well. So my point was that, well, come on, people are not saving PCAP uh, for more than a week or 30 days. Yes, there are outliers who do, but ultimately it is too expensive if you try to capture PCAP. But if you do go with elegant layer seven metadata approach, then you have high value and kind of low to medium expense. Yeah, I'm not touching flows here. We'll, we'll, we'll dispatch with them later. <laughs> and of course, here's the fun one. Here's the fun one that we, is kind of the subject of our discussion today. Network data is not helpful in the cloud. So let's briefly pause here and think about it together. Is network data, network monitoring data, not helpful in the cloud? Let's talk about this. Sometimes people say, hey, NDR, network detection and response in the cloud, is an anti-pattern. The cloud purists, the people who kind of are born in the cloud, would supposedly never do that. If I'm doing a lot of software as a service, like where do you put it? There's no place to sniff. So there's sometimes fairly well-reasoned arguments as far as why uh, NDR and the network security monitoring in the cloud is a non-starter. Like I've encountered some of those from, from, from in, my, in my analyst days, in conference hallways. So, Back in the day, I kind of saw this and I thought, nah, that's kind of convincing. So, and I've spoken to some clients who don't do that and they have good reasons for it. However, I also met people who do a lot of that in the cloud and who kind of started doing more of it in the cloud due to technologies like uh, GCP packet mirroring and a few others, uh, they started doing more network capture in the cloud. So they were going against this. So to me, I've encountered companies who, whose architectures and whose IT usage are such that network monitoring in the cloud is really difficult. If I, am, if I don't have data centers, if I don't have infrastructure as a service and I only use SaaS services, maybe I'm a small business, then what do I capture? Well, there's nothing to capture. I, I'm not gonna capture traffic from my laptops and I don't have data centers and I'm not gonna capture SaaS traffic. So to me, there are definitely edge cases there where NDR just won't fit, it just won't fit. But what I encountered is that there are many cases where it does fit quite well. Uh, and of course, I'm not gonna even um, touch the flow argument because just as flow level capture is not that useful, well, if you can get it, it's useful, but if you can get layer seven metadata, then it's comparatively not useful. And if you're dealing with threats, especially top tier threats, maybe unknown novel threats, flows probably won't save you. At least I, 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 it remains my view from back in the day. Now back to why it's actually very valuable in the cloud. So to me, what I encountered, and let me touch the number two first. When we think cloud, cloud native, cloud focused, as uh, some of my recent, um, some of the recent writing, you, you'd imagine some kind of nirvana where everything is done the modern way, everything is serverless, everything is container. And you know what, that just isn't the cloud at most organizations. You have hybrid, you have multi-cloud, you have, people lift and shift in massive applications without too much thinking about, are we gonna be cloud natives if we put our VMs in the cloud? Frankly, no. The point is that these environments and these organizations are here to stay. We're not gonna all turn into you know, Silicon Valley startups because first thing is their business, businesses are different, their regulations around them are different. So admittedly doing network capturing in the cloud when you are kind of somewhere on your journey to this cloud nirvana that you may never reach, it's hugely useful. Because guess what? There's agent resistance is back. Sometimes people want to have agents in their VMs, but hey, containers make it much more difficult to agent, to, to, to in, in, instrument with agents. 
yeah, you can do it. There are, there are ways that are far outside of scope of the discussion. But ultimately, I've encountered environments where people, security teams are not allowed or not able to put agents. So we are back in the, our original vision for NDR. You can't do agents. What do we do? Logs. Well, what if certain systems don't have logs? Then we are doing traffic. And to me, that's, that argument is as valid in the cloud as it's on-prem, given the realistic environments today. Sometimes you can say, as I did in the previous slide, well, let's just do logs. Let's go, let's go and pick well-designed, well-engineered, reliable, non-performance imp impacting logs from an application. And then you realize that, yeah, perhaps Google applications have those logs, but your applications do not. How are you going to monitor them? Well, if you cannot do agents, and if you, you don't have logs, you're doing traffic. You're, doing code, you're decoding traffic, you're detecting threats, you're saving traffic for investigations. And fortunately, cloud providers like, well, GCP, enable you to capture traffic in a performant way without, you know, breaking the bank. Flow of the shallow, I've been beating this for years and years, and there's a really ancient at this point blog post where I say, Flow logs aren't enough to catch advanced threat actors. Uh, you can look it up on, uh, on, on the Gartner blog site. And to me, this remains true today. And again, people come to me and say, you're saying flows aren't useful. And I'm like, no, I'm just saying flows wouldn't do the trick for many threats. And uh, you would miss things like, I don't know, refer browser agent, so user agent and stuff like that. And you'd never get them from flows. Now, you also need network context to triage alerts. You may get them from your SIM, you may get them from your cloud SIM, you may get them from your piece of infrastructure that sits in the cloud and does the monitoring, like our, our security command center. But sometimes you want to know what happened, what impacted the machine, what impacted the service, if it's not a machine. And you need network data to give that context to kind of understand, okay, I have an alert. What actually happened? Especially for network focused alerts, like say, threat and tell matches. Uh, na people naively match threat and tell to departing traffic and I think, hey, 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 I got CNC. And I'm like, I have news for you. This is not CNC. Look at the traffic. Look at the captures. That's legitimate application talking to an update server or something. So to me, this is why the question to me in my mind is answered. For the foreseeable future, we will be doing NDR in the cloud. We can balance it somewhat differently to other approaches. Uh, there would be environments where it's not a fit, but there would be many environments where it is a fit. And it's a good answer likely for many years to come. That's what I wanted to highlight to the audience. And now back to the core light team. Yeah, thanks, Anton. And you know, this, this idea of uh, all our services are cloud native and they're running in serverless and containers. You know, they, we, I recently read a statistic that said 70% of all workloads in the cloud are running on machine instances, right? On the EC2s and machine images and so on. So, the uh, and we've talked we've talked to you know the the born in the cloud uh, Silicon Valley companies that try to do sort of you know strict network policies to sort of segregate and isolate everything and so on and we've talked to large companies that are you know running their entire cloud infrastructure on a single VPC right because these things are hard I mean it, as as easy as uh, we try to make it sound these things are really difficult to sort of find the balance for so. I, I totally agree that network monitoring is here to stay. And with the uh, introduction of sort of some of the cloud native approaches to tapping traffic, uh, this is starting to become more popular and uh, gain more traction. Uh, the, when you think about network monitoring, the Zeek, you know, for, for those who aren't familiar with Zeek, Zeek is a tool that grew up in the open source community for the last couple of decades. And over time has become the, the de facto standard for how you monitor network and extract that L7 meta, metadata that Anton was talking about. So, so let's talk briefly about what Zeek is and what it isn't, right? Uh, Zeek is uh, a tool that sits off to the side in your environment that sniffs traffic uh, using a passive sort of tap or span port. Uh, and it analyzes your raw network traffic. Uh, it analyzes all the packets in your raw network traffic from a layer three to a layer seven perspective. Two, it uh, turns this analysis into connection-oriented logs, right? So think of you know, every connection being an event, and then every protocol that it parses, it creates a event entry or a log entry for these protocols or insights and generates a bunch of different logs. All these logs are connected by some of the same same uh, sort of schema, right? Like 
connection ID, your IP address, and so on, they're all sort of stitched together so that you can pivot through the logs to find the narrative of what this connection actually did in your environment. And the most important part is the underpinning of this tool, which is Zeek, is a very rich and extensible framework. It's a, a Turing complete uh, scripting language uh, where you know essentially you as a user uh, can write your own scripts to, you know if you want to analyze a protocol, uh, a new protocol, if you want to create a specific detection, if you want to develop some additional insight or some additional data and inject that into the log, you can easily do that with the scripting language that's available on top of Seek, right? And that's what the open source community has been doing for the past several decades, is developing, you know, a whole suite, a whole protocol of sort of open source packages that, you know, enriches the logs that are already out there or creates new log types, right? And that's something that's completely open for any of you. Now, the, the value of these logs is that these are designed by security professionals for security professionals, right? So SOC analysts find a lot of value in these logs because you know, if you think of a typical connection, how you know, a analyst might parse through a typical connect connection would be, you'd start at the con log and you know, the con log would tell you, hey, this seems to be a HTTP connection that originated in your environment. And from that con log, you would use that UID to pivot over to you know an HTTP log because it's you know HTTP connection, and you you know you you'd get information like you know what kind of URL was uh, accessed, what kind of user agent accessed it, what kind of cookies were in there. Uh, you might even find things like this connection actually involved HTTP file transfer, right? At which point you would pivot to the files log, and then you'd be fine be able to find out you know, what kind of mime type was this file, and maybe even look up the SHA-1 for that file to see if uh, this was uh, you know, a, a malicious file transfer or um, a, a, a benign one. Right? So the, the idea is all of this is sort of available at the fingertips uh, of a SOC analyst, and two, uh, be easily extensible for and adaptable for your environment. So, uh, you know the the combination of having uh, packet mirroring like services and sensors that can run sort of you know core light sensors or Zeek sensors that can run network monitoring uh, has been available for a while now. And what what we did as a part of this exercise was we reached out to our customers that are using uh, NDR in the cloud and tried to tease out what are some of the use cases where they're seeing value in NDR in their IIS environment that some of the other tools could not fill, right? What are the gaps that NDR is filling for them? Uh, and that's what I wanted to talk about in the next couple, few slides here. So <clears throat> the first one is, uh, you know, malware C2 using DGA. And <clears throat> I'm sure you're all familiar with DGA, but for those of you who aren't, DGA is a, a pretty common evasion technique for malware where it generates new <clears throat> domains that the malware reaches out to every day. Uh, which is a way for it to avoid sort of sinkholing by providers and so on, right? And the 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 challenge with uh, being able to detect something like this is uh, it's you know the cloud native threat detections have detections built into them for detecting things like DGA, uh, which are somewhat common. But the challenge is, you know, either some of these detections are signature oriented, so they only look for malicious domains or where they are a little more intelligent, they don't fire for a long time or they may not fire at all, right? And that's what some of our customers found is that, you know, they saw the, the detections actually coming in hours or even days after the actual event occurred. When they do fire, the context that you have associated with that alert is extremely shallow, right? You might have the, the DNS lookup, you might have the response, and you might have some details around the, the host and the IP address, but the actual correlation to figure out whether this was a real alert is missing. So you need more data to really triage this alert. And the main challenge is the number of false positives this generates is very large in some environments, right? So if you are an organization that you know, has legitimate services that is reaching out to CDNs, a CDN access could very easily look like a DGA access because it's a a random uh, you know, query, a, a random string of characters, which is a, a, a DNS lookup. 
So you know, you, you need to go through a ton of whitelisting and a ton of tuning and so on to actually tamp down some of the false positives. So you really need the data to be able to triage some of these alerts. So one of the things you could do, right? You could use the, if you had network monitoring in your system, you could use the DNS log uh, that Zeek provides and specifically look for <clears throat> your domain lookups, right? Are you seeing sort of weird, random, really long strings in your domain uh, lookups? Are the domains themselves kind of weird? And most importantly, you know, which of these uh, DNS lookups are actually getting resolved, right? Because that's one of the signatures in DGA is that not a lot of a lot of lookups are random and not a lot of them get resolved. So that gives you an indication of, you know, is there DGA going on in your environment? Uh, the other thing we've sort of embedded some of this you know, knowledge of how DG operates into our sensor itself. So this is something we provide out of the box is you know, a new log type that actually flags on sort of known generator-based malicious domains, right? So uh, with, with that data, you can actually pinpoint if you know, what kind of a, a DG activity is going on by what kind of generator from what kind of host. And once you have that alert, you know you have the entire data set of all the other logs available for you to sort of pivot across and stitch that narrative of you know what's generating this kind of a DGA. So that was an interesting uh, use case. the The other one is uh, exfiltration, data exfiltration, right? And this is well, this is something that impacts almost every organization at some point or the other, in especially in a cloud environment. Uh, where you know you might use a certain channel for C2, but you might use an alternate channel for data exfil so as to avoid detection. And especially cloud services are are ripe for abuse because what security teams focus on is you know all the all the workloads and all the instances running in a public subnet are completely locked down, right? So they make sure that all the right policies, all the right controls are in place for a public subnet. But in a private subnet, the you know you the access out to the internet is locked down for sure. But there is no way, or you know, very difficult to lock down access to all the other cloud native services, right? So, for instance, uh, workloads in the private subnet can access your cloud DNS, can access storage, can access messaging bus, and so on and so on and so on, right? So it becomes really complicated for security teams to lock all of these down which means some of these services could be, are ripe for abuse for this sort of alternate channel to exfiltrate data. Um, we've had you know, a customer report where uh, an attacker that gained foothold into their environment used a legitimate channel for you know, sending logs to a logging service. They use channel, that channel to exfil data, right? Uh, and that's, uh, you know, those are the things that, you know, th there's no such thing as a completely isolated private submit. So you know, in, in that context, we'll talk specifically about DNS tunneling, but you know, the, the same sort of concept or idea applies for any of these Excel mechanisms. Uh, D, DNS is a, a pretty popular tool for tunneling, where they are there are a, a bunch of tools out there which you know you can run, an attacker can run in your environment that sets up a DNS tunnel for uh, them to you know get out of an isolated environment. Uh, and reach out to a DNS. And once you have that DNS tunnel, you can use your DNS query to stuff in the data that you want to exfiltrate. Uh, and it's it's hard to you know completely disable uh, some of these services uh, in the private subnet. And even the public subnet, you know, your attacker might choose to use an external uh, DNS service instead of the native service, right? So uh, there are. Trips, tips and tricks to uh, to evade sort of common uh, uh, controls. So one of the things you could do to detect, you know, exfiltration of uh, you know um, data through a DNS tunnel is once again you could look at sort of the the raw DNS logs to see uh, what you know the amount of data that is being transferred over DNS, the the kind of queries that are going over DNS, and that will give you an indication of you know. Are these sort of legitimate DNS requests, or do these look like sort of randomized queries, randomized DNS lookups that you don't expect? Are they going to the domains that you expect, or are they going to domains that you don't expect? Uh, and, and here's another place where we've built a, a, a specific detection that focus on finding some of these DNS tunnels 
Uh, and that will, yeah, uh, based on sort of variety of techniques that we have seen attackers use in actual production environments, uh, and that could actually flag, you know, where uh, we detect an actual DNS tunnel being used in your environment. Uh, and finally, you know, if an attacker, uh, an attacker could very likely do this as well, is instead of using a, a, a regular DNS service, they could use an encrypted DNS service, which might not be sort of commonly used in your environment. Uh, and that's another thing that you could uh, relatively easily detect with network monitoring as well. Uh, now, this one is, is something where, you know, one of our customers uh, had an actual red team event that they were able to detect uh, with network monitoring that sort of evaded all their other controls, right? And, and this comes, comes up as a, you know, uh, as sort of a subtext of network policies are hard, right? Even, even the most mature organizations find it, you know, easy to block uh, their perimeter and all these sort of external tracing services but find it difficult to put sort of extremely uh, onerous controls on some of their internal instances, right? Which is why a lot of the East-West controls uh, are, are relatively lax, mainly for the right reasons, right? You want dev teams to have access to some of your internal services so that they can troubleshoot and debug and so on. And attackers are wise to this, and this is exactly what they exploit once they have a foothold in your environment. Uh, you know, we, we recently had a, a, um, uh, a report about a, a malware that was using a remote code execution vulnerability on a Nagio server. And once it uh, exploited the vulnerability, it was using SSH to laterally move across a cloud environment, right? So this is a, a very common technique uh, that is exploited in the wild as well. Uh, what this specific red team did was, uh, you know, the, the customers was running a bunch of uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, with the, the hosts on these clusters. Some of the hosts had SSH access available for internal troubleshooting. And the red team was able to sort of laterally, uh, uh, you know, uh, move the data out from some of these hosts using SCP uh, to stage it in an, another environment for exfilling the data, right? And that's something that becomes, uh, you know, uh, requires uh, a, a hard, somewhat harder to detect because you don't have enough sort of monitoring even in your cloud native applications to be able to detect something like that. Uh, and this is where, you know, the this whole conversation that, you know, Anton had earlier about encrypted traffic and how do you actually detect things that are going on in encrypted traffic, uh, which has been done with Zeek-like framework for a long time, right? And, and we sort of expanded what we can do even with a SSH styles traffic by uh, getting sort of detailed inferences into uh, SSH connection. So for instance, we can see things like, uh, is somebody trying to uh, you know, scan your SSH environment? Is somebody trying to brute force attack it? Is there keystroke activity, or is there an interactive session going on where an attacker is actually typing on an SSH session? Is there? Uh, we can even detect more complicated stuff, which you would use in this case. Is like, is there a file upload or download activity going on uh, over your SSH connection? Is MFA being used or not? Is uh, you know, uh, is there a stepping stones kind of attack in progress where? Uh, 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 attacker might jump from a bastion host to a few different hosts before they uh, attack the, the final uh, uh, destination. So, uh, you know, even with an encrypted connection like SSH, it is possible to get into pretty detailed and unique insights uh, into the connection that provides pretty valuable data for uh, 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 SOC analysts. And this one was my favorite one, where uh, you know uh, the one of our customers actually found a live attacker in their environment, right? And uh, the you know they they didn't quite figure out how the ma how the attacker was able to get the malware into their environment, uh, or you know we we didn't find out. Uh, but there are there are tons of common ways of of getting malware into a common environment, right? If you have some escapes in the way you're scanning your container registry or container images. If you sort of, you know, unintentionally uh, download an infected AMI from the from AWS Community AMI, there are tons of ways you could, you know, accidentally 
uh, or you know, be very intentionally uh, attacked uh, and uh, an attacker could drop a malware payload into your environment. But once, and that's what happened to this particular customer is, uh, you know, they, they had a malware drop and it was a novel enough malware that it didn't trigger any of the known sequencer-based alerts, right? So this was a, an attacker with a malware in their environment that was lurking in their environment for a while. Uh, and their first indication of this malware existing was, you know, they saw these sort of oddball things in their HTTP log, right? So they saw sort of anomalous URIs and, and user agents in the HTTP log and some of the components in the HTTP header uh, and these are things, you know, exactly back to our point of, would you be able to find these in VPC flow logs, right? Would you be able to find this in cloud API logs? Unfortunately, uh, the, the kind of detail that is needed to find this specific attacker behavior, for instance, is uh, extremely difficult to get unless you have access to the raw, uh, uh, raw network traffic and the raw packets, right? Uh, and that's precisely what this customer is able to do. And moreover, they were able to find sort of, you know, uh, some of the payloads going back and forth. They were able to find, you know, the, uh, what kind of payloads those were based on the MIME types. And using, you know, a combination of what they found on the network, uh, from the network metadata, plus their, you know, applications log, they were able to stitch a story of how, you know, what all systems were infected and how the attacker was able to sort of traverse their environment, right? And something like that is sort of a unique ability to have, a critical ability to have, and uh, in, in some instances would be extremely difficult to have without sort of network visibility into your environment. Um, so with that, you know, now, hopefully, have you convinced that network monitoring is kind of critical in a uh, a cloud environment? And you know, Anton and I can talk about if you're convinced about network monitoring in your cloud environment, what does that ideal NDR stack look like, right? Uh, so, you know, off to you, Anton, on uh, you know some of your thoughts on, on some of the points here. So to, to continue down that path, uh, I kind of wanted to highlight <clears throat> the fact that there would be challenges in how we do it in, in, in the cloud versus on-prem. And that's to me sort of like an obvious one, unless you are one of those people who assume the cloud is just somebody else's data center. Mm -hmm. To me, there are a few advantages, and uh, I want to highlight maybe uh, a scattershot of those we are describing here. First is, as everything in the cloud, we can achieve a much higher degree of automation when deploying things. Now, I don't know about you, but I recall uh, having to, you know, log around, you know, things and have a screwdriver to like connect things and, you know, ask people where the switch is and all that stuff. So to me, this is, you know, going back many, many years, but, but there's a lot of manual work in deploying network monitoring. And sometimes you would encounter things like, oh, there are no more ports left, or you need to order this device. And so to me, much of this is gone in the cloud. So which removes many, many types of friction that people have reported for network monitoring. And again, as I mentioned before, there's a lot less friction in doing uh, network monitoring uh, compared to say agents, but there's still more friction that can happen. In the cloud, there's less. Uh, there's a lot about performance limitations. If you're doing high bandwidth uh, sniffing and decoding, you are looking at a, a decent amount of hardware if you're doing it on-prem. Again, this is, again, where cloud shines because you can leverage the resources that the cloud provider has to decode, to capture, to do other things. That's, that's there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that other things, again, you can collect. You don't have rogue machines. You don't have things like, oh, there's somebody put a server. Are we, are we, are we sniffing traffic from this? Of course, you can have rogue cloud accounts that you don't know about. That's a bit of a separate problem. But at least you won't have rogue resources that you cannot sniff. So if you have it deployed, you can achieve absolutely 100% coverage. To me, this is an advantage. This is an advantage that sometimes people kind of ignore. They think, oh, yeah, obvious. But it's not obvious. When you're on-prem, you can have things that escape your capture, uh, your capture systems and decoding systems in the cloud. It's a much lower chance of that. And of course, if you have to have a brain, and here you absolutely have to have a brain, uh, such as in the form of Chronicle here, you can leverage uh, that platform, or our platform, to achieve analytics on a cloud scale without paying, without paying for it, without paying much money for it. So to me, these are some of my favorite highlights because 
it allows you to do both easy, effective, scalable, and not an expensive system. To me, this is like a dream come true, right? Sorry, maybe I'm a little too enthusiastic. No, no. I mean, the, I, I think the the ease of use is sort of a, a understated element of NDR in the cloud, right? Because if, if you think of sort of traditional monitoring, getting a tap in your environment is usually a six month cycle of like you need you know your mm -hmm. next team and operations team, and you need a truck roll to get uh, equipment deployed. Here, you know, in a matter of minutes, you can mirror traffic from every machine image that's running across your, your global cloud infrastructure uh, and uh, be able to see visibility. You can turn it on and off you know, uh, at the snap of a finger. Uh, you can uh, you know, enable it on demand, disable it uh, when the demand uh, dries up, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it, it opens up a whole world of possibility. You can look into machines, uh, machine images, but you can even look into sort of inter-VM and inter-container traffic, right? Which is uh, sort of a, a unique ability that we have in the cloud. Uh, and the with that comes, uh, the more you monitor, right? The more data that you're generating. And it's, it's critical that you're generating sort of really high quality, high signal to noise ratio data. And like Anton said, you have a brain that is able to consume that really high volume data without getting overwhelmed by it, or your budget not getting overwhelmed by it as well, right? So it 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 comes with a a huge added advantage, but you need kind of that stack to be able to balance that entire advantage as well. Excellent. And with that, let's take a deeper dive and take a look at what that type of stack might look like. So in this case. We'll look at a, an example NDR solution with a, a reference architecture. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, both source and destination and, and peered VPCs. Um, and, and in this case, we're, we're seeing a, a centralized collector model where instances and in different VPC networks are, are sending the mirrored traffic to a collector uh, destination that's in a central VPC network. So in, in this case, we're using a, a single destination monitor uh, concentrating all of our security tools. Uh, in this case, we have core light sensors, um, concentrating those into a single VPC, um, which helps reduce the complexity of, of managing uh, the tools across multiple projects, multiple VPCs. Uh, from there, we then have core light sending extracted files to a file analysis tool uh, like VirusTotal, and then also sending uh, Zeek logs and Suricata alerts uh, into the brain, into our brain, uh, our SaaS-based SIM, you know, in this case, Chronicle. And then on the right-hand side here, we have a, a list of the logs that are supported uh, in, in the Chronicle UDM. And next up, I think we're going to pass the mic back to Anton, who's going to talk about Chronicle's architecture. Yeah, and this is the slide that many of you who have seen uh, various Chronicle presentations over the years uh, would be familiar with. Again, the platform architecture is quite similar to what you'd expect at a SIM or a security analytics tool um, that, again, many of you have used in the past. One thing to note is that, uh, well, all searches, all searches of structured data take about a quarter of a second. Again, I, I don't stop talking about this because when I first met the team, I was it kind of blew my mind that if you search my log data, the results come back in a quarter of a second. And if I search, you know, a gazillion times more log data, guess how, come, how soon the results come back? Quarter of a second. Because, you know, Google doesn't tell you, hey, 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 we're going to search a lot of the internet. It's going to be slow. Like, it doesn't happen. So why does it happen with your logs? Why do you have to think about it with other tools? Why do you have to think about, like, oh, I'm going to search a year of data. Okay, I can go take a vacation and then come back. And the results, well, partial results may be there. Like, this is the experience I had with other tools. And this is not the experience you'd have with Chronicle. If you're searching the data, it's quarter of a second. Lots of data, quarter of a second. All of the data, quarter of a second. Again, I sound like a broken record or like, I don't know, a marketing person. But to me, this still blows my mind. And since the day I met the Chronicle team first in 2019, this is still the truth. And this is still really, really magical for many use cases. You don't want, you can pivot, you can hunt much faster, you can investigate. The results would come back in a quarter of a second. So that's a difference. There are other differences. We have some of the intel that we match to traffic data, like that from CoreLight and, of course, other data. We have sources of specific telemetry that perhaps uh, others may not easily find. And the part that's also magical is, of course, that you don't pay 
per gigabyte. You don't pay per log source, you pay per employee. So if you have lots of data, if you have a little bit of data, uh, if you have way more data, or if you suddenly have more data than you had before, it's the same price. So if you, if you want to include um, ZIG decodes and you're using Chronicle for you know, firewall data, EDR data, how much more do you have to pay? Nothing, because it's not measured. What we measure is number of employees. Again, I, uh, this is not a technical advantage. There are technical advantages related to search, to threat and tell match, and to other things. But to me, the fact that we don't charge per gigabyte, per megabyte, per any kind of byte, <laughs> and we don't charge for number of sources, and we retain your data for a year, together form the perfect storm of the analytics platform that others just do not have. And many others, frankly, cannot have. Yeah, okay, so this was my probably my... Anton wearing the marketing head moment. But to me, these are all factual statements. These are the, the, the true statements. So to me, Corelight is one of the ideal types of sensors because it's the data you want to have married to other data. It's the data you want to correlate it with threat and tell. And it's the data that's occasionally voluminous. So you don't want to be using it. You don't want to push it into a tool where it would cost you a million just to have it in one place. Chronicle, per employee price, fast searches, Threat and tell matching, detection approaches we pioneered, all give platform a big advantage. Back to the Corelight team. Thanks, Anton. And if you're not familiar with Corelight, uh, we provide security teams with the world's best network evidence through technologies like Zeek logs and, and Sericot alerts. And that evidence is really helpful for security teams to close investigations quickly, even when those incidents go back uh, several years. So for example, when uh, a hack like solar winds hit, how do you know what happened? Um, do, you, do you waste a lot of time on different sources that are disorganized or application centric or, or short lived? Um, you know, looking at what some of the more sophisticated shops do like the NSAs and Mandiants of the world, um, they do something different. They know that successful investigations need the right evidence. So they start with network metadata uh, metadata that is complete, that's interlinked uh, and lightweight. So with, with Coralite, we provide your team the exact same evidence that the NSAs and the Anandians use. Um, so when, when those teams find something, um, when, when, when those organizations find something, you're also able to find those things as well. So we help you get to a position where you're able to catch attackers in the act uh, and close, close out those investigations very quickly, even when they go back years uh, and, and using the tools and processes that you that you are that you already have, so kind of one way to look at it is uh, you know Corelight takes the world's hardest exam uh, and makes it an open book test. So it's uh, really something that's durable and, and gives you an unfair advantage over hackers. Uh, and with that, I think we've reached the end of our presentation. Um, we hope you found this this. Uh, information uh, useful and valuable. And, and if you're interested in learning more uh, about Corelight or learning more about uh, Google Cloud Security, including Chronicle, um, we're going to put a poll up on the screen. If you'd like someone to follow up with you, just let us know, and we'd be happy to do that. So Hillary, if you could put the poll up, I'd appreciate that. And then I will uh, pass it back to you, Hillary, for our Q&A session. All right, the poll is up, so uh, feel free to respond to that. Additionally, if anyone has questions, make sure to put that in the question tab that's at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, we do have a few already, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. All right, let's see here. The first one that I have here says, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the size of data collected by Zeke? Is there a way to estimate that? Yeah, I, I can take a crack at that. The uh, uh, you know typically the the uh, Zeek metadata falls somewhere between sort of flow log and pcap, so it's not as voluminous as pcap, but it's definitely more than what you would see from flow log. We typically expect uh, about one to two percent, uh, closer to probably one percent of your overall network traffic is the amount of uh, logs that we generate with Zeek, uh, right? But depending on your specific traffic type and depending depending on uh, you know what what's running in your environment, uh, that number itself might change. 
All right. We have another question here about the specifics with Zeke. And this person is asking, is Zeke available on Google Cloud Marketplace? So, uh, and I can take that as well. Uh, Zeek isn't available on the Google Cloud Marketplace. Zeek is an open source tool. So that's something, you know, if you're interested in, in running the open source tool, uh, that's uh, definitely, there are great recipes out there for you to be able to run it. Uh, I, I'm personally not aware of uh, folks that, well, uh, I shouldn't say that. that. There are definitely folks that are running uh, their own sort of stack of open source Zeek uh, on, in uh, Google Cloud as well. Uh, and the uh, what Corelite has done is package the open source Zeek and a few other uh, open source tools into a, a, a virtual machine package that's available on Google Cloud, right? So that'll be uh, uh, through the Corelite team, that would be an easy way for you to get it up and running as well. All right. The next question I have here says, um, where do you see traction with cloud NDR today? Um, is there a particular customer segments or application types? Um, can you provide a little insight there? Yeah, and maybe both Anton and I can uh, uh, tag team on this. My perspective is that uh, the, the the customers that are primarily more, uh, you know, Two, two kinds of customers. One, customers that are more mature in their cloud security journey that have gone through sort of the, the you know, uh, that are f further ahead in their cloud migration transition uh, that have probably already gone through like the, the initial sort of, you know, posture management and, and making sure all the policies and controls and so on are in place uh, are now getting into the phase where they might be seeing actual intrusions in their environment and they're looking for uh, data that will help at their investigation that will, you know, the, they're actually looking for active sort of threat detection uh, and threat hunting in their environment. Those are the main customers uh, that we see sort of beginning to adopt uh, Zeek. Um, maybe hand it off to Anton if uh, uh, you have any thoughts on that as well. I mean, I do. So this has been uh, something that I was on a quest to discover back, back in the Gartner days. And I would say that one category uh, that I've, I've not, where I've noticed more interest is people who are kind of wanted to replicate their on-premise visibility stack in the cloud. And again, these are not cloud natives, it's kind of the opposite if you're replicating your on-prem stack, but that's where we see a lot more interest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that these are the only people who would use it or that they are doing anything wrong in this regard, but I've encountered a lot of people who wanted to have wanted to keep keep core light keep zeek with them when they journey to the cloud and the use cases may be uh, sort of a match for their use cases on prem maybe they're doing it for uh, excel monitoring or doing any kind of any kind of compromised assets in their cloud environments to me the use cases sort of match their on prem usage that's probably the majority of what i've seen they were definitely interesting and somewhat peculiar use cases uh, that looked more cloud native, like people wanted to mon monitor microservices uh, access. Uh, to me, these are these do exist. They are probably harder to cluster in, in common groups. Uh, that's how I would describe it. Uh, hopefully, Corelite team has more more beef on this one. Mm -hmm. Yep, that that. That uh, uh, jives with a, a lot of what we see as well. We we definitely seen uh, a, a lot of the folks that are are used to running Zeek in their uh, on-prem environment, looking for that same capability and for the SOC analyst to have that same view across their environment. Uh, surprisingly enough, we've seen a few cloud native folks that are looking to do uh, sort of Zeek from the ground up in their in their NDR environment as well. So we, we've seen a mixed bag here. All right. The next question I have here is asking how easy it is to capture virtual instances um, of traffic in GCP, um, and uh, how does that compare with you know AWS or Azure? And what is the limitation with bandwidth and costs induced um, on uh, copying network traffic? Um, can we provide a little insight there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm happy to take a crack at this too, Anton. Please feel free to add. I mean, I 
Uh, I can speak probably a little more freely than Anton because I've uh, definitely dabbled across the cloud services uh, and, and tried to uh, use these services. Uh, it's, it is incredibly easy to get this up and going in GCP. Um, I, I, I can probably point you to a few blogs out there where you know uh, we've got it down to three CLI commands, uh, which can get you know your packet metering and your sensor up and going in a GCP environment. Uh, and if you're used to using automation tools, then it, it becomes a total breeze, uh, right? The limitation with respect to bandwidth, um, the, the there's sort of two aspects to it. The there is uh, a cost to metering the packets uh, and in GCP specifically, that cost is uh, uh, associated with the, the volume of traffic that you meter. Uh, in some of the other cloud providers, it's not associated with the volume of traffic, but associated with the number of instances. So there's both pros and cons there. Uh, and then limitation with respect to bandwidth itself, uh, the, the instances that you have do pay a tax when they meter packets. So, uh, depending on how tapped out your instances are, you might need to size up some of these instances if you're metering traffic. <clears throat> All right. And last question that we have is, this person is new to NDR. How do you recommend that they get started? What's kind of the, the low-hanging fruit, something that they can tackle quite quickly? That is actually a great question, and, and and we get this all the time. Uh, I, I'll I'll say one of the one of the things I would plug here is uh, we you know uh, within the the Zeek open source community uh, we have started doing uh, uh, sort of education and training events called uh, Capture the Flag, uh, where you get an introduction into Zeek data and Corelight data, and you're actually able to sort of walk through uh, you know a, a few sort of challenges for finding you know sort of unique things or or odd things or actual attacks through this data so that might be a good way to start uh, with you know getting familiar with NDR data and network monitoring data these are freely available for the open source community so you know that's something uh, you know uh, might be a way to start out with uh, and once you're convinced that there's some value in it and you want to try it in your environment, uh, and if you are a GCP customer, for instance, you know, uh, you can reach out to us to get sort of an eval version of this. Or if you're handy enough and you want to try out the open source Zeek, you know, that's something you could do as well. And like I said, it's, it's relatively easy to get up and going. And once you have it, you know, you could focus uh, your uh, effort on some of the basic use cases, right? Like just sort of going through the con logs to to get sort of a, a understanding of what's going in, what's going on in your environment. What are some of the services that are talking? What kind of traffic is is uh, being initiated and terminated in your environment? Uh, what is the amount of traffic that is transiting off to certain services and so on? So that might be a way to just sort of know your environment kind of start. Uh, and from that, then you can sort of dive specifically into, you know, either investigations or so on. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll add on to that as well as um, it, we're also uh, at Corelight running a program called Corelight at Home, which is um, a way to run Zeek and Suricata on a Raspberry Pi sensor. So, uh, you know, something interesting that you can do while we're, you know, in this work from home period. Um, if you just do a Google search for Corelight at Home, I think you'll, you'll pop up. Uh, uh, there should be a blog post that pops up with more info on that. And then, then another good complimentary resource along with that program is the Corelight Threat Hunting Guide. Uh, provides some, some guidance and some examples on um, different uh, things that you can look for using Zeek logs, look in your environment for, for threats. Um, it's a really good, good resource for um, getting started using NDR data uh, for threat hunting. All right, awesome. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time at this point. Um, but I did want to say a big thank you to Anton, to uh, Vijit, and also to Edward for presenting today. Uh, really, uh, really appreciate all the great insights that you had um, and answering all the questions from the audience. Uh, also wanted to say a big thank you to Correlate, who's the sponsor for today's webinar. We appreciate your continued support of CSA. 
If anyone does come up with additional questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to the folks um, who have their emails on the screen there, or you can reach out to the CSA research team at research at cloudsecuritylines.org and we can get you connected with today's presenters. Additionally, down below the presentation screen, uh, you'll find a tab to rate and review the webinar. Please do so. so don't forget to hit submit. All right. And finally, the recording of this webinar will be available within a few minutes of the conclusion. You just need the same link to rewatch. To view other recorded webinars or to sign up for new ones, you can go to cloudsecurityalliance.org slash research slash cloudbytes. Thank you everyone so much for attending today's webinar and have a wonderful day. Thank you.